Lovely, right, hello and good evening. Uh, welcome to Stowe Talks. Now, tonight's session is about tech abuse. Uh, tech abuse, what it is and how to stop it. Now, it's a difficult topic tonight. Domestic abuse is a difficult topic anyway. Um, and it's a topic that we've covered quite a bit on this webinar so far. Um, unfortunately, the types of abuse are so varied uh, that we're even able to host different sessions on different types of abuse, uh, which is what we're doing tonight. Uh, it's a sad reality, I'm afraid. Um, I could go through a lot of the statistics regarding domestic abuse. Um, we have done that here before on several occasions. The most recent crime survey for England and Wales published a report stating that an estimated 6.9% of women and 3% of men have experienced domestic abuse in the year ending March 2022. So these figures do not appear to be going down. Now, the tech abuse side, which is what we're talking about tonight, that has soared 97% since COVID. Bonkers, isn't it? Technology is part of our everyday lives. It's our phones, our iPads, our laptops, our social media, our watches. It's supposed to make our lives easier and more efficient, but in some cases, it's just making us far more vulnerable, okay? Now, tonight, we've got two experts sharing their wisdom and advice. They are Dr. Lisa Segura from Portsmouth University. She's a reader in cybercrime and gender and also Emma Pickering from Refuge. Refuge is brilliant, where she is the tech abuse lead, okay? Now, both guests have impressive CVs and they're true leaders in their field. Now, I'm really pleased uh, we could have them both together in one session. They complement each other beautifully. They also know each other very well and they're gonna work together in tonight's presentation, which is brilliant. And between them, they're going to be covering exactly what we need them to cover, which is what tech abuse actually is, the various forms it takes, the tools that are used by the perpetrators and the tools that are available to help victims and survivors and also what support is available. So very important. Now, I suspect we might have some new listeners uh, tonight. So a big welcome um, from us to you. You might have registered for this webinar because you have because you have an interest in the subject of domestic abuse. Uh, you may be a victim, you might be a survivor, you might be a family member of a victim. Uh, you might be a counsellor or a lawyer or even at law school. It's wonderful that you're here and we welcome you in whatever capacity that you are here in. Now, the beauty of Stowe Talks is that our listeners drive our content. I do feel that tonight's session is really important. It's a sign of the times. Tech abuse isn't what I was talking about on a day to day basis in my uh, professional life 15 years ago, but it is now. Um, I feel that this is just the start of us probably covering this topic in a lot more detail. Um, tonight's format is going to be obviously Lisa and Emma's presentation and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Um, on a housekeeping front, as always, we're going to be recording tonight's session. For questions, please by all means let us have your questions, but use the Q&A function. If you look on your Zoom screen, it's in the top right hand side. This is a safe space. Uh, it's a safe space for people to listen and ask questions. Um, you can also use the chat function. Obviously, please be respectful, um, but also feel free to give us feedback. As I say, these webinars are driven by the people who listen to them. Uh, so let us know what you want to hear about next. Um, and I think that's it really on the housekeeping front. Just um, while I've got a, a captive audience, so to speak, our next Stow Talks will be the 29th of March. It's going to be on starting a family through donor conception. So again, a bit of a, a different kind of um, move there. Again, as a result of, of what people have said they'd like to, to hear about. So back at the end of uh, the month on a very different topic. Um, so I think right now, uh, Lisa, I think we're starting with you, aren't we? Are you ready? I'll, um, the floor is all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak about this topic tonight with you all. So yes, my name is Dr Lisa Skewer and I'm a reader in cybercrime and gender at the University of Portsmouth. And I've been researching the field of online gender-based violence for about seven years. Um, and this has involved me looking at lots of different 
topics in that field, things like image-based sexual abuse and online uh, abuse and harassment, and also work on the incel community as well. But what I'm going to be drawing on tonight is the work that I did with colleagues from Portsmouth and the University of Kent for the Home Office, in which we looked at the role of technology in domestic abuse situations. And I'll be covering what tech abuse is, the various forms it takes, as well as the tools used by perpetrators. And I'll touch briefly on as well some of the key drivers that we found in that research as well. So just to begin, I thought it'd be useful to set a little bit of a bit of a context. So imagine being in a relationship where this is repeatedly said to you. Take down pictures from your social media profiles. They're going to give others the wrong impression and I don't want people looking at you. If you loved me, you'd share everything with me. Therefore, it's just easier to adhere to their wishes. Take down photos and give them access to all your online accounts and passwords. How about this phrase? I worry about your safety, so you must share your location with me at all times. Therefore, you allow them to set up tracking devices or software, such as Find My Phone, to be able to monitor you constantly. However, the number of tracking devices they actually set up is far more than they tell you. This relationship is abusive. The person you love and trust is coercively controlling you. Of course, that realization is incredibly difficult and you start making plans to end the relationship. The abuser becomes aware of this. Messages start to disappear from your social media accounts, while posts that you didn't write are made, which portray you in a negative light, as if you're slowly losing your mind. The abuser tries to stop you accessing your bank accounts. The abuser makes threats to release intimate images of you to your family and friends and all your social media contacts if you do try and leave them. You aren't aware of consenting to have any intimate photos taken, but it doesn't matter. The abuser has either taken them when you were unaware, asleep, for example, or has created them using deep fake technologies. You do leave them. Then the endless communication begins via phone, text, messenger, social media, ranging from begging you to come back to threats of physical violence to you or to themselves. You think you found somewhere safe to live, free from your abuser but then you start getting messages outlining where you've been and at what times. Random takeaways are delivered to your house that you didn't order, followed by the message, I hope you enjoyed the pizza. You discover that profiles have been created about you on dating sites and strangers are calling your mobile because that has been posted along with requests for sex. Your abuser is still retaining an omnipresence in your life and you are terrified about what they're going to do next. Now, sadly for many, mostly women, victims and survivors of, DA, of domestic abuse, they don't need to imagine parts or all of this scenario. It is or has been their very real lived experience. So tech abuse. So technology facilitated abuse or tech abuse is understood as interpersonal violence harassment or abuse that is conducted using mo mobile, online or digital technologies, or even a combination of all of them. It is a wide ranging term that can encompass many subtypes of abuse, including harassing behaviours. So, for example, sending offensive, distressing or damaging communications um, towards or about a person online sexual and image-based sexual abuse, such as coercing online sexual acts or creating or sharing sexual imagery without person's consent, monitoring or controlling behaviors. So for example, unauthorized access to digital devices, gathering information about a person, or even seeking to restrict behaviors. Emotional abuse and threats are also part of these patterns, and that can involve things such as sending communications that threaten harm to the person or others. And research has shown that the technology facilitated abuse or tech abuse is a growing concern for service providers responding to domestic family and sexual violence in particular. And really what we're talking about here is an extension of and, 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 in, and included within the repertoire of coercive and controlling behaviours. So turning to forms of tech abuse. So I mentioned harassment. 
So, uh, so technologies provide a unique set of tools for engaging in a wide range of harassing behaviours. Technology enables individuals to reach multiple victims and survivors across geographic and temporal barriers, all while remaining potentially anonymous. Now, online harassment, which many of you are well aware of, refers to offensive, distressing, damaging communications towards or about a person online. Now, due to the accessibility and affordability of the internet and digital technologies, in conjunction with its relatively unsupervised nature, online harassment provides an opportunity for offenders to expand victimization, and it can create much more severe consequences for victims and survivors as they can continually be victimized. Perpetrators are posting harassing and derogatory content about their victim on social media. Now, what we found in our research is it's often not undertaken from perpetrators' own accounts. Rather, anonymous profiles have been created in order to perpetuate the abuse, whilst in other cases, perpetrators have hacked into their victim's social media account and posted content from there, often presenting them in a negative way, which then potentially alienates them from friends and family who can also become embroiled in the facilitation of the abuse. Perpetrators have also signed their victims up to hate groups as well to embroil them in criminal activity. On other occasions, perpetrators have created fake profiles of their victims, which in itself is not a criminal act. However, this is usually undertaken with a view to humiliate or disparage the victim and can then lead to other acts which are illegal, such as the posting of intimate images of the victim. So moving to sexual and image-based abuse, this refers to the non-consensual taking and sharing of or threats to share nude or sexual images. While the unlawful distribution of images is not a new problem, technology has provided avenues for image-based sexual abuse to happen on a far larger scale. Now, domestic abuse perpetrators are engaging in what is more colloquially or mainstream um, known as revenge pornography, although I really detest that term, it's entirely inaccurate and it does not account for the severe harms that victims are experiencing. Um, hence why I'm using the term IBSA, image-based sexual abuse. Um, and what we're seeing is the perpetrators are threatening to release intimate images or videos in order to regain control over their victims. So we had the domestic abuse, um, the new Domestic Abuse Act come in last year, and the legislation targeting these particular behaviours was expanded to include those threats to disclose intimate images with the intention to cause distress. But in other instances, perpetrators are setting up fake social media profiles of their victims and are using them, which those fake accounts, as I said, are not necessarily illegal in themselves, and they're using them to disseminate indecent images. Um, another means of distributing materials have been to send them directly to friends, family, as well as employers as well, to try and destroy their careers and their professional reputations, as well as posting them publicly online. So monitoring and controlling behaviours, also cyber stalking. Um, what we're seeing here is that technology has allowed greater access to those wanting to monitor and control others. So particularly as apps and devices have become more affordable and accessible and part of everyday use for people and consumers. We're seeing common technologies being used to monitor and control. And these include GPS trackers, geolocation software, um, and that can be used to keep track of victims and survivors' locations. We see spyware and keyloggers that are monitoring and controlling victim and survivors' use of technology and social media, as well as audio bugs and physical hidden cameras to monitor victims and survivors' physical interactions. Um, and then in, in regard to how this fits in within the broader spectrum of cyber stalking, that has significant impacts on those who experience it. It can make the victim and victim survivor feel as if they have no privacy, security or safety. It's eroding the spatial boundaries of abusive relationships and creating that sense of omnipresence and the permanence, the feeling of being trapped. So prolonged hypervigilance and fear as a result can have psychological impacts such as anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder 
and victims and survivors may restrict their use of technology, rupturing their social connections, which is incredibly damaging in today's digital society where we rely on technology for every single aspect of our lives, not to mention the fact that it's deeply unfair that the people that are innocent, the people that are experiencing abuse are then having to change aspects of their lives or miss out on being online um, for, for obviously, you know, reasons for being scared. Um, hacking or accessing victim social media and email accounts is a common tactic of perpetrators. Now, perpetrators don't necessarily need specialist digital skills to be able to hack into accounts. Um, I'm using that word um, in the sense of the Computer Misuse Act, where it's unauthorised access. So if you haven't got consent, you're obviously breaching that legislation. But often how perpetrators get access is just through a range of different means, just being able to easily guess the password through intimate knowledge of their partner um, or passwords are manipulated out of people. For example, in the relationship where if you love me, you'd share everything with me. Um, perpetrators are also noted as linking email accounts. So if partners change a password, they would receive notification of that and then be able to, to intervene in that situation. Um, and additionally, shared social media profiles are common in coercive and controlling contexts. And Really, um, concerningly, there's a wealth of guidance readily available online for would-be perpetrators to breach different social media platforms and email accounts. So there's advice um, just readily available on Google um, about how to hack into your partner's WhatsApp account, for example. Um, and it'll explain how to do this by posing as the legitimate account holder. So what we're seeing is that organizations are not realizing these loopholes to protect their users. Um, other means, uh, for example, is posing as employees of the very organizations themselves. So it really screams volumes about the lack of their own cybersecurity practices. Um, so in regard to emotional abuse and threats, so we know that perpetrators are using technology to perpetrate this emotional abuse. They're sending the threats in the context of domestic abuse. It's part of an ongoing pattern of abuse, which can be both physical and non-physical. We know violence is not just physical. We know it's not, that's why it's not domestic abuse. So it's not domestic violence, it's domestic abuse because people get so Miss, it's completely misunderstand the whole context of that. So it so it's part of that pattern of coercive co coercive control, and it involves manipulative behaviour to coerce, control, harm. We're seeing perpetrators using tactics to undermine confidence. They're blaming, they're humiliating, intimidating, and twisting the reality of their victims. And they do this through technology, using phone calls, text messages, emails, social media. It's all part of that gaslighting pattern as well. And then briefly, I'm not going to go too much in, into depth in this, but it's also the link with economic abuse as well, where um, access to finances are being blocked. So if a perpetrator does have access to the bank account's password, for example, well, they can change the password, they can, they can block access. Um, and obviously that puts the, the victim in a really precarious situation then, where seemingly on the outside, they have assets, they have money, but of course they don't have access to it in this context. So turning to tools of um, tech abuse. Um, so in the in the research that I mentioned that um, colleagues and I undertook for the Home Office, um, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, apologies, but the, the research uh, methods that we employed were interviews with experts, domestic abuse service providers, um, such as people like Emma, um, and um, a, a, a quite, a, quite a, a large uh, media case review looking at... Um, uh, published uh, cases whereby uh, technology had featured within the sort of domestic abuse context, um, as well as a technology review. And this unsettingly involved researchers um, getting themselves into the mindset of would-be domestic abuse perpetrators. So conducting Google searches as if you were looking 
for guidance, tools, tips, techniques on how you could hack into your partner's account, how you could monitor them, how you could um, surveil them and control them, all of that. And um, it's 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 really it's really unnerving how much information is just readily available out there, and there's no kind of oversight of this. Um, and so, from the guidance to the tips to hack into social media platforms to physical devices, which are often disguised as many different toys and everyday household items it's a it's 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 a really concerning domain so um in regard to those COVID devices um I mean these things I think ordinary well they were previously kind of thought of as the domain of spies or something um and now they're just readily available and they're easily accessible and they are cheap as well and it's also the normalization about it the way that they're just presented as if it's it's okay as well to to use these these sorts of devices i mean so if we start with our you know with our mobile phones i mean they they can be used of course they have recording devices and they are being used to record conversations and video activities then we then we go to the kind of specialist gadgets that are disguised such that only experts or you know, people that are looking for them and know what they're looking for would be able to spot so I mentioned things like toys which is deeply unsettling because that involves children then being unwitting spies for the for the uh, for the abusive parent um other examples of things like smoke alarms clocks plug sockets air fresheners pens really the banal the everyday kind of items that you'd ha be you'd have in your house and just ex be expected to be lying around that's what are being used now to contain these covid cameras and for example 20 years ago these devices would have been really hard to get hold of and you know, probably expensive but now as I said they're cheap they're just a click away on the the major platforms the ones that are, that are legitimate the ones that have got the the reputation um so therefore they're validated if they're being sold on these big brand out big brand platforms then that you know what, what's the harm in them as well um and if a person's using them in their own home, it's not necessarily illegal, obviously. Um, but if they no longer live there or never have, then I think it's clearer about whether or not that offence has been um, committed. And even more so if recordings are then published, you know, uh, um, obviously without consent and things. But it's still a really great area. And there's so, so little work that's being done on this, and particularly in the context of domestic abuse. Um, and then we have the Internet of Things. And so perpetrators are very good at adapting to new technology and exploiting legitimate tools. So we're seeing things like smart devices like Alexa, Hive, the heating system, ring doorbells being used within domestic abuse contexts. So, for example, if you've got a joint account for Alexa and then that's not removed after a victim has ended the relationship, which is acknowledged as um, a time of escalated risk of serious harm and even homicide. The perpetrator will be able to know everything that's been delivered to the property and even details of the new address. And if a victim is planning to leave, then the perpetrator can work out the behavior of the victim. With Hive, the perpetrator is able to emotionally abuse, gaslight and inconvenience their victim by changing the heating in the house, while Ring could be accessed by perpetrators to see who is visiting and when the victim enters and leaves the home. And then with apps and, st and stalkerware, it's this what's what's difficult is the sort of dual use of these things so whilst you have some spyware which is marketed as stalkerware um and it's meant to be used in these kind of contexts we also see things that serve legitimate purposes like find my phone and um uh, and apps which are meant to be able to monitor what your child is up to being used and abused in these contexts as well. 
And the problem is that these apps that are designed to protect and empower people are also inadvertently putting them at risk because perpetrators are misusing them to stalk and control. And they're just too easily repurposed. Um, also things like keyloggers. So there are other types of apps and devices that are predominantly used for stalking. And they work by collecting the passwords of the victim, which can subsequently be used to gain access to sell several online accounts, including social media, email, and even those financial accounts that I mentioned, um, and then dating sites. So accounts on dating sites or apps are a type of sensitive information that is being targeted by partners in abusive relationships as well. Um, and in one of the media cases that we looked at in our research, we found that a man after his girlfriend left him set up accounts on swingers and dating accounts in her name and with her workplace listed to credit her. Um, and so what you find is that victims are not only dealing with the direct abuse from the perpetrator, but they're then having to contend with all, you know, all of these other really harmful and distressing things as well. Um, of course, which is just sort of really sort of exacerbates then the, the harmful context that they're in. So just briefly, uh, some of the key drivers, um, want to emphasize this isn't an, an exhaustive list it's also not necessarily in isolation of each other some of these motivations could well intertwine um or be more prevalent at different at different parts of the of the relationship as well um so things like the breakdown of the relationship it could be to get revenge um to monitor to try and um get back with the victim um to secure evidence of infidelity to secure evidence for divorce or child custody proceedings the financial gain to pervert justice and even sexual gratification and um when a victim is considering leaving or has left their perpetrator our research found that the extent of tech tech abuse will probably increase or where it is not already occurred is likely to be implemented and that's predominantly because the perpetrator is seeking to to regain or gain control um uh yeah so uh, as i said it's not that it's exhaustive there may be many other reasons as well but this is really what sort of came out in our work um and i just briefly wanted to note the gendered nature of tech abuse which does follow the gendered nature of domestic abuse as well um what we are seeing is that overall overall women victims and survivors of tech abuse um are significantly more likely to report emotional impacts from the most recent experience of abuse as compared to male victims and survivors as well and I think we need to really understand as well how it occurs and can vary according to the gender of the victim and the survivor and or the perpetrator. Um, now, in our research, we did try and include uh, as well all genders where possible as well in terms of who's the perpetrator, who's the victim, um, including um, trans persons and um, persons of non-gender binary and move beyond the heteronormative lens as well to include persons from the LGBTQI plus community. But unfortunately, they are really hard. That's really hard data to get to. It was very, it was kind of quite limited. And so we didn't really um, get much insight there. And we really did sort of just engage more with women as victims and men as perpetrators. So just to highlight some of the key points, I think it's really important to note that tech abuse is part of a wider continuum of abuse, which is not separate from other coercive and controlling behaviours. It needs to be considered in that broader context. But also when we're talking about context, um, we need to appreciate that maybe just looking at, uh, we can't just label an act as abusive as well. It does the same, the same act could be okay in a healthy relationship but really damaging in a in a in an abusive relationship and it's also not thinking about things in isolation as well again if you look at it on its own for example oh the heating's being turned on well that seems quite banal and i'm not trying to be facetious there but when it's part of that wider pattern of abuse it's terrifying as well so we need to always take take all of those points into consideration um the 
the really stark finding from our research that the guidance and tools that is readily available to perpetrators online, that awareness or work challenging that is really significant. Um, everybody we kind of spoke to in the interviews with the service providers, the real experts, you know, the, the general consensus was that within coercive control of relationships, the use of technology to further the abuse is, is mostly likely. Um, and I think just because we have technology within, within the label of this, um, we need to move beyond any kind of misconceptions that you need technical proficiency to be engaging in this form of abuse. It's part of everyday life. The use of tools, digital tools and devices, it's just, it's ubiquitous. It's embedded in everything we do. So it's just part, it's just, it's just extending the repertoire of what tools are already available to perpetrators. And it's just the logical next step that they would be using them. And just finally, to emphasize that the harms are no less serious than those arising from physical violence. And I will pass over to Emma now. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we've already introduced myself, so we can skip this slide, but thank you. I just wanted to give everybody um, an overview of the Technology Facilitated Abuse and Economic Empowerment Team. I appreciate that is a mouthful. Um, we're a very small team that work within Refuge, so Refuge are the UK's largest organisation for domestic abuse um, services for women and girls. Um, and we work nationally, locally and internally within Refuge. So nationally, we have a national youth, um, sorry, a national helpline tech lead. So if you have um, any clients, um, any women or children that need any support, they can go through the National Domestic Abuse Helpline and they can be supported with tech concerns, economic concerns. And also we have a dedicated lead that can support with really complex cases as well. And then on a local and internal level, we also support our internal services. So make sure that we're offering training and support to our frontline um, advers, refuge workers, so they're responding to technology facilitated abuse and economic abuse. Um, sorry. And in terms of local as well, we also work with our local services. Thank you. Uh, we also work with our local services as well. And um, we have a number of services uh, within Refuge. We have um, a number of accommodation based services and community based services as well, which where in which when a woman is referred through those services we also offer those women support as well we also do offer support to men as well if they come through to refuge that's important to to note um but we don't receive many male um, referrals to come through um next slide please lisa thank you our key messages within the technology facilitated abuse team are to stay one step ahead of changes as technology is constantly evolving and changing so a lot of the time that the team dedicates is to research to make sure that we are staying ahead of any trends. We're aware of new developing apps, um, social media sites that young people are using, devices that perpetrators may be wanting to misuse, as Lisa was mentioning earlier, that sometimes it's your everyday items that may be misused that we're all using, but also sometimes there could be more discreet um, methods of technology that could be misused. So we need to make sure that we're staying ahead of changes. So if a survivor comes to us and says, my perpetrator is, I suspect is harassing me, monitoring, stalking me in a particular method, then we need to be mindful of the different ways in which that could be undertaken, such as vehicles, for instance, new vehicles having built GPS systems. So if a woman is fleeing to go to a refuge, we need to be mindful of that her process there, her journey there could be tracked. So we need to make sure that we can support her to get there safely. We make sure that we empower women to use technology safely and avoid further compounding their isolation. It's really important that we don't do what some other agencies unfortunately do and that say to a survivor, you need to come offline, you need to be responsible. It's very victim blaming language and it's really not helpful. We also know from research as well that it can escalate into physical violence if a survivor shuts down their social media accounts, comes offline. So actually it's about making sure that we can empower them to use technology safely. And a key thing as well when we speak to our survivors is most of them haven't set those devices up themselves. They haven't had access to the accounts. They have very limited knowledge on how their settings and privacy features work. 
So it's really important that we empower them to become more confident to be able to navigate those settings because we're only going to be here for a period of time to support them. We need to make sure that moving forward, they feel confident to keep using those devices safely in the future. So that's really the key is to make sure that women are confident to be able to use those devices and those accounts safely. Promote a learning culture. This isn't just within refuge. This is externally as well. So it's really important for us that while we have knowledge, research information here, we share that as well with our other partner agencies. So smaller buying for charities. Uh, we make sure that we deliver training to them. We share our resources, our information as well, because we recognise that every survivor is going to come to a refuge for support. There may be other charities that they go to for support. And we want to make sure that this isn't a postcode lottery for survivors. They can receive the same support irrelevant of where they go. We aim to avoid educating perpetrators. So we've got a tech safety website. So within that, there's guides and resources that can talk someone through how to secure a site. But we need to make sure that we're, when we're spreading awareness, we do so without educating people and being too in-depth and too descriptive around how technology can be misused um, in a way that could educate perpetrators to notify them that this is a method that you could be misusing against your partner. We lobby government and industry leads, so we work with our policy team very closely because we're really keen to make sure that legislation and policy keeps up to date with the ever evolving changes of technology. So most recently, the online safety bill, it's really we're really keen to have a VOR code of practice included in the online safety bill. So it makes sure that women are safeguarded on social media platforms and online platforms as well. And also the naked threat campaign. We started that campaign because numerous women were coming forward to us and saying that their perpetrators were often threatening to share intimate images online. And when they were reporting to the police, the police were saying, can you come back to us when the image has been shared? Because it's not a criminal offence. And that's a really uneasy feeling to ask somebody to sit with. And it just isn't helpful. So we started the campaign to make sure that threats to share intimate images was criminalised and that was successful in 2019. Next slide, please, Lisa. So when you have initial contact with a survivor, it's really important that we ask ourselves some key questions here. And those are around that initial conversation when they're reaching out, are you safe to speak to me? So years ago, that probably meant, are you in the same property as your abuser? Because if you're in the same property as him, he could hear the conversation. Now it means, is, there, is the device that you're calling me on safe? Have you got any suspicions? that you could be being listened to right now on the device. Has he had access to the device? Are you concerned there's any listening equipment, monitoring software on the device that you're concerned about? And you have to kind of ask these questions in a very brief summary, which is difficult, but it's trying to establish that if this device is compromised, she really needs to be calling you back on an uncompromised phone if she can. So can she borrow a family friends? Has she got a work phone that she can speak to you on? We also send burner phones out to survivors as well to make sure that they can contact us safely. And then we conduct a risk assessment with them. So we consider all the different forms of technology facilitated abuse. So similar to what Lisa was going through earlier on, unpicking all the different forms of abuse, but focusing on devices and apps and accounts. And then we complete an intake and then we assess the location as well and develop a safety plan with the survivor. So the key considerations there are, what does a safe conversation look like? So asking questions like, are you concerned about the room that you're in, the building that you're in, the house that you're in? Are you concerned that you're being listened to? Is that a reason that you're calling for support? Is that a factor in the abuse that you're suffering? So they're key conversations that we need to be having. Next slide, please, thank you. When we're making safe contact with a survivor, we always consider the client's phone. Is she being listened to? And does the perpetrator have access to her phone records? Not everybody now has paper printed versions, but sometimes you can still go online and you can download um, a list of calls that have been received incoming and outgoing as well. So we need to be mindful of calls that she's making on a device that could be compromised. So we need to start by asking questions around pattern of the perpetrator knowing about the calls that she's had to try and assess if it's on the device that we need to be concerned about. Whose name is the client's phone contract in? So for most survivors that we speak to, it's in the perpetrator's name. 
because it gives him access and he also likes to remind her quite often as well that if you leave I'm going to report that phone as stolen and then I can then flag it up and I can request the location as well from the phone provider so I'll know where it is at all times. So it's another powerful tool for that perpetrator to be able to monitor the calls. So it's really important that we make sure that we're speaking to that survivor on a safe phone. If the client has accessed her phone, um, contract details online, would the perpetrator also be able to access these details online? Does he know the details to her online account, for instance? And most often he probably will have coerced her in sharing the information or he could easily guess it. And we're all guilty of this, having the same passwords, um, account details across multiple platforms. Um, and maybe there's a potential there that he's also gained access to this information. And again, going back to if the conversations at home are overheard, is this only when the client's on the phone or is this when she's not on the phone? So then we need to start considering other recording devices within the home. It could be smart devices that are listening in. It could be recording devices, listening devices. So we need to start probing and asking some questions there. And then emails. What we often find is people are really great at asking the initial questions around, is it safe to talk to me on a phone? Have you got any concerns about this phone? But then what usually happens is sometimes agencies follow up by sending emails to that survivor. If that survivor has identified that that device is a problem, um, there's concerns around the security of the device. The, there's a potential there that the perpetrator can access the emails as well. So we need to be mindful of the email is not necessarily secure. And quite often it's really easy for a perpetrator to gain access to a survivor's email account. What we've noticed is a favourite tactic of a perpetrator is to not make it really obvious that he's in her account. He won't always block her. So what he'll do is he'll forward particular emails on. And when we've spoken to survivors, the most common emails that are forwarded on are through solicitors because it's key there. They want to know about financial settlements, child contact orders. They want to then find the evidence of what she's discussing with her solicitor ahead of court meetings. So then he can provide his evidence and always be one step ahead of her in court and discredit her at every turn. So, again, it's thinking about and being considerate about is her email secure? So can you send safe emails to her email account? Or do we need to be asking her to set up a separate email account? We always advise clients to use ProtonMail. And the reason that we advise people to use ProtonMail is because it adds additional layers of security. So it just offers the survivor some reassurances that she can be using a safe email account. Next slide, please. Thank you. I think there was a question in the um, chat very early on, and I know that Lisa's um, made reference to um, key loggers, which is a way that you can monitor and track um, somebody's online movements and activities through laptops, computers, et cetera. But we are unfortunately seeing a real increase in survivors coming to us and identifying that they are they have numerous tracking devices located on their personal items and recorded and listening devices as well within the home and trackers also within um, their vehicles. So it's important to try and identify patterns. That is key. Try and assess where the physical tracking device is located by identifying patterns. So starting to ask survivors, does the perpetrator know where you are going? Does he know particular routes? Could he know that because he knows where you go to work? He knows where you drop the children off or are they different patterns? Is he turning up? To where you are um, we need to try and assess what the situation is so then we can assess where the, the devices are potentially and then help to search so advise the client what the device may look like and places to search now this is really difficult because as Lisa was mentioning they are purposely designed to be very discreet and to hide to be disguised as household items so air fresheners plug sockets <laughs> extension leads I do apologize <laughs> Um, any kind of home devices, it can be quite discreet, pens, etc., remote controls. So they are incredibly discreet. And they. so what we do is we send a list and imagery to, to survivors to help them navigate and search their homes because they are best placed to search because they know their personal belongings better than anybody else. And then safety planning. Establish where it's safe and safe to speak to the client when she's at home. And sorry, just going back to the helping for search, I just want to touch upon there's a number of survivors that are coming through to us and saying that 
they have found online agencies that will come to their properties and their, and check their vehicle, vehicles and search for them and charge them extortionate amounts of money. We're talking thousands of pounds. And the concern with that is that, you know, when they then go and report to the police, the police then can turn around to the survivor and say, well, you've paid this individual. They could have placed them there for you. There's no evidence that they were placed there by the perpetrator. So actually, it's really not helpful to pay all of that money. I appreciate that people want some reassurance and to be able to help identify them. But you could potentially be putting money down the drain and not having the outcome that you desire at the end of it. And we don't want survivors to be who are already vulnerable, placed in a situation where somebody's exploiting that vulnerability. And then gathering evidence as best as you can. So looking at where the tracking has taken place, if it's safe to keep a log, do so and photograph any devices found and hand them over to the police. Thank you. One of the biggest pieces of work that we do with our survivors is obviously around location settings. We move a lot of survivors into refuge accommodation. So we need to make sure that when we move them, we move them safely. So we do tech assessments with them. So we make sure that we we check the basics before we move them anywhere. So we're making sure that their location services are off within their phone. Because quite often, some, sometimes people overlook that setting and don't realize that it's on automatically as default. Also making sure that they're turned off within particular apps that you're using. And how are you going to navigate yourself safely to a place of safety? So are you gonna be using an Oyster card? Are you gonna be using a contactless card to make payments, which will then track and trace where you've paid? Are you going to be using a vehicle with GPS tracking as well? So they're all considerations that we need to be having with a survivor to make sure that they can move from one place to another safely. Uh, next slide, please. So when we assess for technology facilitated abuse, we first go back to making sure that we can establish safe contact with that survivor, making sure that it's safe to speak to them. If not, we establish another safe method of contacting them or provide them with a burner phone. Are there any location concerns for that survivor that we need to address, initial safety concerns that we need to address immediately? And then we move on to assessing and completing a risk assessment. So prior and post admission to refuges, looking at things such as stalkerware location services and making sure that we go through that in detail with them. We also have um, assessment tools as well, which we complete. So we also include children as well. So we go through with the survivor, every device that they have and the children have, every account that they hold and the children hold to make sure that we can secure them all because as Lisa was mentioning earlier, you can be um, located through many different means, such as online shopping accounts, food accounts, because everything that's linked back to your online purchase has a location within. So we need to make sure that we're securing every single account and device. So that's again, going back to that, what, does, what technology does that client have? And what are the concerns? So during the tech assessment, we ask the client particular questions. So is their location compromised? Have they left the property and did they leave any devices behind? We've supported survivors where they fled to a refuge and they've done everything that they should. They've changed um, their, they've turned off location services. They've um, made their um, security features um, secure within their devices and accounts. But then what's happened is there's been an old iPhone that's left in a drawer somewhere at home and they've completely forgotten about it because it's you know years old and he's turned it back on and it's linked back to her Apple ID and then he's been able to sync the device and then find her location. So it's about being mindful. Of, are there any other older devices within the property that you fled that we need to be making sure that we can log you out of and we can make sure that we're setting you up with new accounts as well? Are they worried that they're being tracked and monitored? What leads them to be concerned? Are there patterns and behavior? So going back to that conversation to try and tease out of the survivor, what are your concerns? And listen to them because quite often by the time they come to you, they've probably been told, you know, your story sounds very unbelievable. This isn't possible. This isn't plausible, but they are. It's, it's incredible what tech, technology can enable a perpetrator to achieve. So we need to be mindful that we're open to all possibilities. And as Lisa was rightfully saying that there probably is more than one. We're not looking for one isolated form of technology that's being misused. And quite often when we speak to survivors and we do an assessment with them, what's quite apparent is 
there are numerous devices that he's compromised. There are, he's in every single account. He's in her email account. He's on every single social media platform. There is everything. And then there's all the children's devices that are quite often compromised and he's been monitoring as well. So we need to be mindful of all devices and accounts because it won't just be one single isolated incident. And how techy is the perpetrator? And we always ask that question because we need to try and establish what is the survivor's tech knowledge as well. You know, did she set up the account? Does she feel confident to navigate her settings? Does she need a lot of support? And what knowledge does he have? Does he have connections? Does he have um, information and resources available to him that could compromise her safety and location as well? But as Lisa was mentioning earlier, it, you don't have to be tech savvy to be able to perpetrate technology facilitated abuse. Unfortunately, it's accessible and it's very easy. But when you do have a particular um, perpetrator who is particularly tech savvy, that does add additional layers of complexity that we need to be mindful of. And these were just some general points when we are um, speaking to survivors. So being inquisitive and asking questions, encouraging them to listen to the trust in their instincts, because it's really important if they have a feeling that something isn't right quite often, they are right and they should um, act on that. But also really important as are there any immediate safety concerns that we need to address? And quite often we'll have referrals come through to our service where we're being asked to secure the Wi-Fi, but she doesn't, she's still living with the perpetrator and there's no plans of moving anytime soon because she's not safe to do so. We can't make big changes to the home devices and the Wi-Fi because it will alert the perpetrator. And sometimes you have to sit with the knowledge that she knows that a device is compromised, but she can't make any big changes because it would compromise her situation because it would notify him. And sometimes it isn't safe to completely cut all contact. We have to do things gradually. We have to make changes gradually as well until it's safe. And she's in a safe place to make the bigger changes. So sometimes that's why the safety plan has to be tailored to the individual. So generic safety advice around technology facilitated abuse can be incredibly dangerous. So it's about tailoring it to that individual person's needs and their situation. We have some resources. So we have the Tech Safety website, which has content available online around securing your devices. They're visual guides as well. So if a survivor's first language isn't English, we've had survivors that have landed on the website. They've been able to navigate the settings and features um, with you while using the guides because they're visual. We also translate the um, website into Polish and Urdu. We have um, a glossary there, which gives a breakdown of different um, forms of tech abuse. So it helps a survivor if they're not sure of a different term, um, also support for survivors. So giving, um, there's a page there that's dedicated to supporting survivors around myth busting. We also have our digital tools. So we've got a tech um, home safety tool so again, another visual guide that talk, that navigates you through a house. So looking at your home devices and making sure that you can keep them secure. And the digital breakup tool looks at your apps on your devices, such as your online shopping, your Just Eat accounts, your online banking. And alongside the tech safety website, we have um, the tech safety, the tech bar, which is another visual tool that we have where you it talks you through and it's a video that can be used. So if there's a particular um, device account that's um, an issue, such as you need support with turning off your location settings, um, securing your social media accounts, there's visual videos that talk you through step by step on how to secure your account. So it's broken down. So it's made um, really easy for survivors to be able to kind of grab that information in the short space of time and go back to it and refer to it later on if needs be as well. Oh, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I will wrap up now. But um, are there any questions? I think we'll have a few, Emma. Um, okay. That was brilliant. That was brilliant, both of you. Um, it's fascinating. I don't really want this um, our session to end because I could chat to you both endlessly uh, and share um, experiences and stories that have come up um, for me and my team um, over the years. Now, there's a couple of things I just wanted to kind of uh, touch on. Um, can we just uh, recover the point about the most common items in the family home where these devices are? Well, the ones I've come across have been USBs. 
um, or they look like a USB that's sticking out the back of a stereo or something like that. Mm -hmm. I loved your reference to, you talked about a plug, Emma. Um, you know, uh, any other obscure things? Did you, did you mention air freshener or something? Yeah. No, yeah, bonkers. Yeah, Lisa, do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? I mean, uh, I think um, you mentioned this, but extension leads, that was a really common one. <laughs> and that, I think, you know, most most houses will have those things, but it's even in, I mean, some of the some of the scenarios that, that um, service providers spoke with us about, it'd be, it would, it would just, it would just make sense that, you know, the, the perpetrator would be like, oh, you know, I'll help you move in. I'm being, you know, I'm being nice and supportive. And, oh, you know, look, I've set, you know, look, I've set up all your electrical equipment, you know, with an extension lead, you know, and, and, and you wouldn't question that. And then that extension lead has got a listening device in. And then that that perpetrator has been able to hear everything that's gone on to conduct that abuse where they say, you know, being able to recount everything that's going on to maintain control over the victim and then even use it in custody proceedings as well. They're able to go there with loads of evidence than from conversations that they've overheard. And that's not always questioned in court either. No, no, it's not. Um we're lucky i'm obviously talking to everybody from yorkshire um today and, and in leeds we're very lucky we have a, a local uh i can only describe it as spyware shop that will check out devices if people go in um which is 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 really helpful for us but again you've got to find the device first um uh and it can be um quite a tricky one now um somebody helpfully mentioned in the chat that i think if you take items to a phone shop they'll also be able to help. But um, yeah. um, the, 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 one of the best things here, I, um, I have to say, um, Emma, is actually that the, the pages on the Refuge website about sorting out your tech. Um, my team know to send those uh, web links to their clients if we've got problems. Um, yeah. It, it um, empowers them if they've got mobile phone problems. Um, obviously, we're very hot on checking uh, that we can communicate safely um, with our people uh, to start with, but um, it's um, it's exhausting. It must be it's exhausting for survivors. Absolutely exhausting it to is. think everything you're doing is being listened to um, and used against you. Now, um, if we could possibly just recap on one um, area for one of our uh, listeners today, and that was. Um, I think actually probably we've probably answered it really with the um, how can you find out if someone has tracking on your phone and laptop? Well, we kind of cover that on the refuge pages. But if you have suspicions, can we just check come um, cover off those first steps if you think something's happening? Emma, do you want to take this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's important to note that Stalkerware doesn't sit on the victim's device as well. So even if you are handing it into a phone shop or anybody that has the capabilities to look, they may be handing it back and trying to reassure the survivor, actually, I haven't found anything, but that might not be the most helpful <laughs> advice. It's things such as um, what we say to look out for and be mindful of if you are concerned that there's monitoring devices, or there's monitoring applications on your device. It's things such as battery drainage and excessive battery drainage as well. I'm, I'm not talking about your normal apple which starts to lose battery life quite quickly after a few years it's excessive um you'll need to be charging your phone probably every 30 minutes um it does um drain the battery incredibly quickly also your data usage is going to double because somebody else is monitoring your online activity as well um your phone's going to glitch it's going to be excessively hot to touch as well messages may disappear emails may disappear and then pop back up again but the biggest thing, the biggest indicator of all is somebody having access all of a sudden to information that would only sit on that device, such as if she's never shared any intimate images or images at all with another person, they suddenly have access to that or threatening and know the details and information of those images. That would suggest that someone has access to my camera roll. If someone's relaying to me in detail about my note section, that would suggest to me that they have access to that information. Same for WhatsApp. Same for details of calls, because you can listen into calls, you can listen into the device at any given time. It gives you a dashboard as a perpetrator on your laptop, on your phone of every activity that that person is doing online. So they can go into their online banking, they can go online, they can check to see that their search history, they can monitor it in real time. 
a perpetrator is going to, even if he doesn't realise, give key information away that would lead her to suggest it isn't just one thing. So it isn't just that I need to be concerned he has access to my WhatsApp account, for instance. He will know far too much information. So that would lead her to be very suspicious. And then alongside that, with the activity with the phone, with the battery drainage, excessive hot touch, et cetera, would be it would lead you to be suspicious that there's software on my device that I need to be concerned about. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks, Emma. That's great. Um, Can I just add, sorry, because it's just really, really important. A key thing here is if you're going to remove the software, um, some people, what they do is they factory reset or they purchase new phones time and time again. You don't need to purchase a new phone. The phone isn't compromised. It's the cloud system that's compromised. If you factory reset the phone, but you're using the same um, account details as before, Google account, Apple ID, that's where the compromise, it's going to go be back onto that um, account again. So it's about when you factory reset, you need brand new accounts as well. You need a new email account because what happens is survivors come to us and say, I've brought three new phones and I've factory reset twice now and it, this problem's still happening. I'm not prepared to do it again because they're exhausted at this point, understandably. And you don't need to go through those methods. It's about factory resetting new accounts, new Apple ID and new email account. I think maybe rather than a follow-up email we need to do a follow-up newsletter to these uh, webinars sometimes sorry to interrupt um just quickly there was a couple of comments on the chat about is echoing during phone calls or buzzing on calls any kind of sign of uh, somebody listening in they could be could it but it could be other things factors yeah. as well to be considering it, it could be poor connection etc i wouldn't necessarily just assume it was it was stalk aware and we don't want to alarm people or cause concern because stalkerware could be a whole session in itself. There's lots of information to cover. We're just trying to cram in very quickly um, key points and information. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lisa, this is a bit of a random one for you, but and I don't know how well you know it, but what are your thoughts on the Domestic Abuse Act from 2021? Helpful or? Well, I mean, it was, it was good to, to actually have a definition for starters mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean obviously having the so like things like um uh image-based abuse um you know having um the so, so yeah the threats i think that that was really significant because the, that was a huge loophole but that yeah but i mean it doesn't address everything so for example with that particular offense i mean the fact that it's not classed as a sexual offense um, it's really frustrating and so victims are not automatically anonymous so no I mean there's, there's just yeah there's this there's, some, there's some things that are positive but there's also you know it's not really addressing the, the the broader problems yes I agree I agree entirely my view's always been that it's it's um it's a start it's better yes. than nothing we didn't have it before so we have it now great but there is so much further to go isn't there yeah and there's um, still like there's still that underappreciation and misunderstanding of what coercive and controlling behavior is yes and, and um i have to admit within the legal community as well um we uh obviously hear about all types um but the remedies don't always uh work quickly and they don't always provide the uh remedy that 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 is needed um, so a lot of work needs to be done uh, in respect of that. Um, if anybody does have queries or problems or legal nature that they want to have a chat through, feel free obviously to contact us and we'll be more than happy to, to have a help uh, to help if we can. Um, the uh, questions, um, Kate, can you have a look from your end as well? I think uh, sorry, seen... sorry, I'm muted. Sorry. Um, okay. There was just one in the queue and Q&A, what if your solicitor's not being supportive that you got through the legal, legal aid system and seem to be favouring the perpetrator? Well, that doesn't sound like a very good situation. Um, I would be surprised if they were actually favouring the perpetrator, whether or not they're trying to manage expectations in terms of the strength of evidence. That might be more of a, a likely scenario, but you are able to sack your lawyer. People forget that. The lawyer you have is not the one you have to stay with. If you don't feel you're being listened to, and even if you do have obviously legal aid, you can still move your file. That's not a problem and do it. If you're not happy, go. Would be my best advice there. 
unfortunately I can't help you we don't have a legal aid uh, certificate but there will be plenty others and if you need some direction let us know okay a couple of others have come in Sarah as well just while you're answering that one so um, why is stuff gathered via a listening device admitted in court? Surely it is illegal to gather it. Emma? <laughs> I was just going to say the difficulty here is quite often because it's in the family home, what's argued is um, he, they've both consented to having that information, that device in the family home, and it's used for the purposes of um, security and then what's happened is it's been edited to such a degree that it, then it's used in family court against somebody and it isn't actually ever been put there in the first place as security purposes so it's the the reason behind having the device in the first place because it's in a family home that's um, argued in court and that is when the family courts are saying well actually yes that's a justifiable reason for you to have that device within the home and that's the concern that there's that lack of family court understanding around coercive control technology facilitated abuse. There's also the difficulty that in some proceedings, so for example, financial proceedings, when you're getting a divorce, there isn't a huge amount that's relevant within the actual court procedure to a certain degree. Conduct is a very narrow element um, and domestic abuse, um, although it's it's horrendous, it isn't given perhaps the, the uh, uh, the lead role that perhaps it should be um, and that's very hard for survivors to um, understand it's, it's the way it is um, I'm happy to expand on it another time but um, survivors will quite often feel shortchanged throughout the court process when they're dealing with something like a financial settlement um, because of the, the the tight tightness of how conduct is is dealt with within the statute or by the courts um, it may change um, but it may well be uh, a, a bit of a waiting game. We waited long enough for the Domestic Abuse Act. So um, these things don't change very quickly, I'm afraid. Um, any more, Kate? Have I missed any? Uh, yeah, just one dropped in now. My perpetrator has covertly recorded video contact with our child at my parents' house. Can I do anything about this? Can it be used against me in court? Um, go and see a lawyer. We need to see what that video, what you know, what is the footage actually showing, or what are you trying to to gain? Uh, is it is it, is it uh, uh, showing abusive behaviour? Is it showing something that's putting the child at risk of harm? Is it going to further your case? Um, so yes, we need you need a professional to to assess that really. Um, it's a difficult one to navigate. I'm sorry, I do feel very lawyerish sometimes, sitting on the fence giving these answers. Um, without kind of more, we, we kind of don't always, uh, we can't always commit, but um, hopefully that helps. Very sorry, I've got a dog kind of walking I think, in. The I think it's important to add as well, obviously it's really difficult because you're trying to navigate uh, family courts where um, there might not be a great deal of understanding of how technology can be misused, but it's about reminding them that actually videos can be edited to be perceived in a particular way. So, I don't know what the content of that video looks like, um, but it's about being mindful of, and we have seen videos that are edited to such a degree, and the methods like Lisa mentioned earlier are deep fake technology as well, so they can be edited where it's not even that individual within that image and that video. So it's about being mindful of if you're not happy with the content and you don't believe that the video is a true representation of what happened, then you can argue as well that actually you think that this video has been edited to be perceived in a particular way. Um, so it shouldn't be taken at face value as well. And that is really difficult because obviously then you don't have evidence of the original video. But if you're not happy with the, the content that is shared in court, it's about reminding them that your perp the perpetrator could have potentially edited that video. Um, um, we could go on for hours, couldn't we? We absolutely, we really could. Um, Sorry, there's just another, another one dropped in, Sarah, just while you're answering that okay. one. So, uh, why are stalking victims not entitled to a solicitor under legal aid, despite the cost incurred to them to relocate, yet the alleged perpetrator is entitled to a defence? Very complex oh. question to answer. Difficult, difficult. Um, we need to kind of, um, we would need a context in terms of, of where 
um, are we are we talking about um, stalking in terms of this being a prosecution under the Harassment Act, um, or are we um, doing kind of a civil injunction that sort of thing? Um, stalking. I would assume stalking would constitute the type of behaviour that um, would so satisfy the criteria for an injunction like a non-molestation order or an occupation order. Um, legal aid is uh, always means tested still. Um, why is the alleged perpetrator entitled to a defence? Uh, we are a democracy and a respondent always has a right to reply. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, abusers will tend to lie in their statements and the courts have not a huge amount of time to get to the bottom of what really happened, um, which is why injunction proceedings can be particularly frustrating uh, for people in the family courts uh, at the moment. Um, again, can that be improved and will that improve? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Any more, Kate? I'm not sure if this is a question. Not sure if this is a question or, or, oh, sorry, it was a follow up, sorry, to the lady that just asked the legal aid question. So it's prosecuted for stalking via criminal court, uh, no SPOs, no orders, etc. So it was a criminal offence. Really don't, I really don't know um, on that front, I'm afraid. Um, this is where there's a bit of a hole in my knowledge because I'm not actually a legal aid practitioner. So I can't give you the criteria for definite. Um, but if you do have legal representation, then, then um, or even, I'm trying to think. Can I jump in? Sorry. Yes. Please, um, yes. I was just going to say, if after you went through criminal court for stalking and there was no stalking protection order at the end of that, that's a complete failing, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, but please do contact the National Domestic Abuse Helpline because we can look at supporting you to obtain orders. Um, if you need support in terms of restraining orders, non molestation orders to keep you safe, if after there's been a prosecution you still are concerned that your perpetrator can make contact with you because there's no safeguard in protective measures in place after um the court hearing so I'd, yeah please do contact them and we we can try and support brilliant thank you emma that was a far better answer than the one i was going to be able to give far better right i think i'll bring everything to a close unless there's something else case by this no we're good good right well Ladies, thank you. Um, there's been a, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, love to a certain degree on, on, on the chat, I think. Um, it's a very difficult topic to cover. I'd like to cover it again, actually, um, at some point in the future. Um, I'd love you to come and both come talk to my team as well. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe in the future, that would be lovely. Lots of um, gratitude being expressed in the chat. So thank you very much, everybody who's been with us tonight. Um, as I say, uh, thank you very much to both Lisa and Emma for their expertise and lovely presentation tonight. Um, we are changing our topic for the end of the month. We're going to the happier end of family law uh, to starting a family through donor conception. That's the 29th of March. Um, we'll be releasing the emails and the usual follow up email to this one um, after, after today's session. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening, everybody, and stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.